All right, howdy everyone. This is a first attempt at this presentation. Uh, I did a little test run before this and it took 28 minutes, so I'm probably going to have to go kind of fast. Um, didn't think I made that much content, but apparently I did. So, today I'm going to tell you about Alfago Baca. Now, Alfago Baca was born February 27th, 1865-ish. It's pretty up for debate because, uh, as you can see here, he was baptized 12 days before he was born. So we have a pretty rough estimate of when he was born, but that's the most popular date. Now, his mother's name was Juanita, and legend has it that she gave birth to him while playing Las Iglesias, which is just softball. She jumped up to catch a ball, plopped him out right there on the field, and uh, they, they took him in, cleaned him up, and, well, little baby Fago was born. Now, this is a little small family tree, his direct family. Uh, I couldn't find very much on what Francisco Baca was doing for the entirety of uh, El Fago's life, but I know that they moved up to, to Topeka, Kansas early in his life, where he learned to like read and write and exist, essentially. Um, his mother, Juanita Baca, his sister, Aloisa, and his brother, Herminio, all died within a month of each other while leaving in Topeka. He never talked about how, uh, he just said it happened, and he was pretty bummed out. Now he had an older brother, Abdenago Baca, and his older brother was supposed to take care of him in Socorro when he moved back, uh, but he was kind of just an orphan in Topeka for a couple of years. Um, his brother was gone when he got back because he went to Colorado to look for work, as many people did. Now, his early life was, like I said, confusing. He was in Kansas until around eight years old, but he was an orphan for a little bit there as well. Now, he went, by the time he went to move back to Socorro, he was around 16 years old, so he didn't need anyone. You know, he was basically a man already. Uh, he spoke only English, basically, and he was actually afraid of people that, you know, he was just afraid of Mexicans at the time. He was terrified of them for some reason, even though he is El Fago Baca. Um, so he got culture shocked a bit moving from Topeka, Kansas, to Socorro, New Mexico. Who would have thought? Now, El Fago had a lot of tall tales, so I'm going to discuss sort of what my sources were here. Now, most of my sources are uh, the book I got, and then a couple of other books that it referenced, and then a lot of, like, historical documents, like newspaper clippings and stuff. Uh, all of this said, El Fago talked a lot of shit. Everyone talked a lot of shit about El Fago, so I tried to take all of these stories compare them to things that we can actually verify happened, and also kind of just shoot for common sense on what the most likely course of the action was for how the stories went. Um, I'm going to show this video clip. I'm just going to show the intro part because I'm strapped for time because I made this presentation kind of long. But we'll listen to a little ballad about El Fago and a little, uh, a little recounting of his life as told by Walt Disney, which is a bit historically inaccurate, by the way, but we'll get to that. Um... El Fago Baca, the man who couldn't be killed. So for instance here, they did not use dynamite in the Frisco shootout. So that's just some uh, some Hollywood stuff right there. Uh, they actually sent guys to go get dynamite, but no one ever came back with any because shit was far away and kind of expensive. Four thousand bullets. That's a lot of lead, isn't it? That is a lot of lead. The man whose story you're about to see actually held off a lynch mob of eighty cowboys who fired four thousand rounds like this into the flimsy shack where he was hiding. He came out of it without a scratch. And miraculously, so did the statue of Santa Ana that shared the siege with him. His name was... El Fago Baca In the land of big men When this great west was wild El Fago was small And his nature was mild And the legend was that Like El Gato the cat Nine lives had El Fago El Gato He dared to stand up To the 
toughest of men. He faced all their six guns again and again. All the people in town and the folks all around sing the praise of El Pago, El Gato. El Pago was wise and El Pago was strong. El Pago, El Gato, who made right from wrong. And the legend was that, like El Gato the cat, nine lives had El Pago Baca. El Pago Baca, light-hearted adventurer and lightning-fast gunfighter, but always on the side of justice. The Mexican-Americans, whose rights he always defended, called him the man who could not be killed. This is the first of several adventures titled The Nine Lives of El Fago Baca. Nine lives had El Fago Baca. All right, so that's sort of like the introduction of uh, the beginning of that TV series that, or I don't know if it's a TV series, but a series that Disney did called The Nine Lives of El Fago Baca, where they talked about all of his exploits and things. A little historically inaccurate, um, but we'll, we'll talk about that when I talk about the Frisco shootout. Okay, so one of uh, El Fago's earliest tall tales is uh, that he spent some time hanging around Billy the Kid. He met him at uh, some sort of cattle roundup uh, down in San Antonio. They became buddies, and they decided, you know what, we're going to hit the big city of Albuquerque. So they saddled up their horses. They rode up to a sled of Pueblo where they hitched up their horses and caught a train to Albuquerque. Now, when they got to Albuquerque, they set up camp and then uh, kind of went on their way to explore the town, and they witnessed an immediate murder, unprovoked. So APD's been at it for well over 100 years now. Um... Charles D. Campbell, he was a railroad carpenter, and he was shot like five times by a police officer known as Milton J. Yar Yarbury. Now, that is true. The shooting and the fact that it happened and the time that it happened, that's all accurate. So Alfega was calling it like he saw it there. Now, what doesn't make any sense is the fact that uh, at this time, Billy the Kid should have been in Fort Sumner with a $500 bounty at least on his head. So it's a little hard to tell if he actually uh, hung out with Billy the Kid or not, but uh, we could probably assume not. Now, this is the Frisco Shootout. That's what that episode was about. I was going to show the whole thing, but it's long. Um, so what we expected to happen is the arrest of John McCarty, uh, leading to a shootout with El Fago and 150 cowboys where they shot 4,000 shots, four men killed, eight men wounded, and a 36-hour standoff. Now, some of it's correct. I mean, it actually did start with the arrest of John McCarty. Um, John McCarty was a little drunk and disorderly, and he discharged his weapon in a general store, and so El Fago was like, hey, you gotta teach this guy a lesson. He's being a fucking asshole. And so he arrested him. Uh, now, the townspeople, like, they kind of like John McCarty. You know, he was kind of annoying, but, like, he wouldn't hurt a fly. He wasn't a bad guy. But El Fago was just, you know, he's a lawman. He was, he was, he was tough on crime, I'll tell you. Um... Now, this led to an altercation in between the trial and the shootout where El Fago had actually fired some shots at a guy and his horse ended up crushing him to death. Um, but it got him to fuck off for the time being, so he wasn't too upset. And he thought they were being rowdy hooligans anyway, so... He's just taking lives, I guess. Now, the shootout only actually had, like, 45 to 60 cowboys, which is still a lot of fucking cowboys. Uh, some people say 80, some say 150... But yeah, I think this range is the most realistic. And the actual amount of shots fired was 400. Um, now, something interesting to note is that El Fago originally was under the impression that it was 400 shots, but when one of the people who witnessed the entire shootout said 4,000, he was like, fuck yeah, I'll take that, I'll put that in my story, that sounds way cooler. And so, that's how it became 4,000 instead of 400. You know, like Dr. Pick was saying, just add some zeros and you're a legend. Um, four people actually were killed, but the number wounded is a little hazy, because they didn't really, you know, document all the injuries that well. Um, so we had one guy get killed by his horse. One guy, Alfago, just blasted in the chest when they were trying to break down the door. 
and the other two guys kind of just got caught by Alfago while he was shooting out the windows. Um, now, something interesting to note also is that Alfago wasn't trying to kill people here. He was actually a very, very good shot. And so the only times I think he actually killed people were sort of on accident because he was trying to get them to fuck off, but also maybe they were a bit more dangerous. Um, and the actual standoff only lasted about 33 hours, which isn't really that big of a difference, so it doesn't matter that much. But yeah, it just goes to show that uh, we embellish things a bit in history sometimes, and El Fago was quite the storyteller. So Now, El Fago was often called a ruffian, but he was also a lawman. Um, after the Frisco shootout, he was actually the first to stay at uh, Socorro County Jail while it was still under construction. But he ended up getting a change of venue to Albuquerque, where he ended up meeting his future wife, uh, Francisquita Palmer. I don't know how to pronounce that name. Now, she promised to marry him as long as he was acquitted for all of his murder charges. And lo and behold, he was acquitted for all of his murder charges. So they got married, August 13th, 1885. Now, at this point, Alfago became a deputy sheriff and the county jailer. Um, he did this from, like the early 80s to 86 or 87 when he became a deputy marshal. Now, not a lot of people knew that he was a sheriff because he was always just being an asshole. Um, he was always in the newspapers, but never as being being a lawman. Um, every time he got mentioned in the newspaper, they'd spell it Elfigo Baca. They never really got it right. Um, but yeah, he was just, you know, he was he was doing his due diligence as a lawman, but often mistaken as a criminal. Uh, he'd pull guns on a lot of people, and not a lot of people took too kindly to that. But, you know, he's from a wilder place, I guess, so they weren't really ready to deal with that. Um, now, in his time as a sheriff and a lawman, El Fago's preferred method of catching criminals was sending in the letter. And uh, this letter would say something along the lines of, Hey, turn yourself in by this date, or I'll know you're trying to resist arrest. And if you're trying to resist arrest, I'm going to assume that you intend to hurt me so I won't feel bad when I shoot you on sight. And uh, this had a 100% success rate for getting people to turn themselves in. Everyone that he was tasked with turning or going and getting, he'd send them a letter and they'd turn themselves in because he had this massive reputation of being one tough hombre. So um, the only sort of blemish on his record, I guess, for uh, catching criminals is... One of his prisoners escaped once upon a time, uh, but to rectify this, he gave his cellmate a gun and a badge and a horse and sent him off to catch him in exchange for a reduced sentence of some sort. Uh, and the guy came back. He caught the guy at the Arizona border, and the cellmate and the guy who escaped were brought right back to Olfego in Socorro. So he knew how to manage people, I guess. Now, during his time as a police officer in Albuquerque, or a sheriff, rather, um, he almost incited a riot because his buddy Jesus Romero had gotten into a fight and resisted arrest, and he was trying to fight off police officer Henry and save his buddy. Now, during this confrontation, people came to aid El Fago, and once people saw people going to help El Fago, people went to go help Officer Henry, and it was this, this whole shit show of people screaming and fighting, and, uh, Eventually, Alfago just kind of gave up and let, let Romero get taken and later claimed that he was actually just trying to help him arrest the guy. So he did his best to uh, save face there, but I don't know. He didn't look too good. Now, as punishment for this entire ordeal, he was given the choice of a $10 fine plus expenses. So who knows how much money or 30 days in jail. Now, what the judge didn't know is that Alfago was the county jailer. So Alfago, smart man that he is, First and foremost, took that uh, prison sentence. He was given 75 cents a day to feed prisoners, and since he himself was a prisoner, he turned out with a cool 2250 for what was supposed to be his punishment. Uh, I just think that's hilarious. I don't know how true that is, but I can't find anything refuting it or supporting it, so just Baca's bragging. Um, but I love that story a lot, so I thought it should be shared. Now, after this stint in Albuquerque of being, well, you know, a police officer and, uh, and a lawman, he decided to move back to Socorro, get back in touch with his roots, I guess. 
And at this point, he learned how to speak Spanish pretty fluently. And so he was becoming quite the Mexican-American representative. Now, he had a lot of jobs in Socorro during this, like, you know, 10-year period. He worked as county clerk, mayor, superintendent, and district attorney. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those. So as county clerk, he didn't receive any salary, but he got fees for every sort of thing he recorded. Um, now, every December and January, he would actually offer his services for free to help out the poor people in town. And I think this contributed to him being elected mayor for a while. Uh, there wasn't really much talking about his time as mayor in Socorro, but there's people claiming that Socorro was the best city in the state at the time, so he must have been doing something right. Uh, he also spent time as superintendent, where he put a lot of money into the school system. Um, he did this to get provide incentives uh, to get kids to actually show up to school. So if you had perfect attendance, uh, if you were a little girl, you'd get $5. If you were a boy, you'd get a little medal that was apparently worth $5. And it actually helped people, it, it, it showed visible improvement in the school system. I mean, getting, getting the kids to show up is half the battle. So, you know, it did pretty good for the, for the school system. Um, he served a very short term as district attorney. Uh, now, when Elfego is vague about a story, you can probably tell that something shitty happened to him. So, it seems like here he lost his uh, job because he arrested this... Uh, Chinese inspector for concealed carrying weapons, and he wasn't a fan of that because I think it was literally illegal. Um, but this guy worked for the federal government, and he had friends in high up places, and so his friend in high up places, Governor Herbert James Hagerman, who we can see on the right there, uh, removed uh, removed El Fago from office as the DA, so lost his job pretty quick. But he got a new one where he was a prosecutor for some cattle association in Sierra. Um, he claimed that they gave him, gave him $500 a month in salary, and he was damn good at his job, according to everyone who was working with him. He was really good at catching cattle rustlers and, and prosecuting them, however that means. Now, during his time in Socorro, he kind of worked as an apprentice in a firm where he was studying law. Now, he was admitted to taking the bar after reading one, bur one book called the, uh, the Fundamentals of Law, and... Uh, a few, a few chapters from another book, which was basically, basically just a collection of papers. Uh, he was actually criticized by his buddy Kellner um, that he had a very scarce knowledge of, uh, of law before he went and took the bar. But two months later, he became a junior partner to score a law firm, so I guess he didn't need to know that much after all. Now, uh, during his time as a lawyer, he actually met a judge that hired him as an interpreter and a bodyguard because he's bilingual and he's one tough hombre, so... He got to work with this judge for, for a little while, got paid room and board and a salary. Now, while hanging around this judge, he, he got into semantics while traveling around. Um, he overheard two Texan ranchers talking about a $2,000 bond they had from this confrontation with an elderly Mexican man. Uh, the way they described him, he was just some old Mexican guy that couldn't speak any English. So, El Fago, being an absolute genius offered to settle the case for 500 bucks, and they were like, yeah, sure, that's way less than 2000 Um, So, to settle the case, El Fago found a random elderly Mexican man that couldn't speak English, talked the judge down to a $50 fine, claiming that uh, Roswell was very poor, so they needed, uh, they, they needed all the money they can get, so that $2,000 bond was too much. Um, he paid the guy $25 plus $50 for the the fine to just plead guilty and the guy didn't really know what he was agreeing to but you know he got his money and he worked out okay um the plan worked out literally perfectly like it went without a hitch um well when he was walking out of the courtroom with this elderly mexican man the two texan guys were really shocked to see that it was not the guy but el fago responded in classic fashion with what the hell do you care the, the case is settled isn't it so it's just sort of a, a beautiful show of the kind of guy Elfego was. Um, another instance here was during Prohibition, uh, Elfego defended a man accused of selling whiskey to an Indian man. Now, both Elfego and the judge were avid bootleg whiskey drinkers. They didn't give a shit about Prohibition, so this case was already, you know, dead in the water, but they had to do it anyway because of that due process. 
Um, so when Alfego was defending, you know, trying to convince the jury, he showed off the bottle and said, this bottle, it's labeled whiskey, but no one has ever tasted it or smelled it, so how can they be sure? And then he went on to say, if I put a sign on my back that says I'm Jesus Christ, am I the Savior? And uh, after covering up his smile, the judge kind of just let the jury uh, go with the case, and uh, the man was the man was not to uh, find anything for his his crime. Now, at this point in his life, things got pretty interesting. Uh, he was involved with some international political figures. Um, now, General Jose Inez Salazar uh, fled to America during a power struggle against Pancho Villa, um, and he was actually detained because. They don't like when Mexican revolutionaries come into the country and then go back to Mexico because it makes it makes America look kind of bad. Um, but Salazar was a rich man, and he <coughs> excuse me, he um, he basically gave Alfego a blank check. So Alfego walked up to the cashier and said, "Hey, I would like thirty thousand dollars to defend this man in court," and he was surprised to see them actually just sign it and hand it over. And when he was talking to the, uh, the bank cashier, the guy was like, yeah, we were supposed to, we were told to pay you anything up to $100,000. So Alfego was really happy to get his 30000 but probably pretty disappointed when he learned he could have made out with hundred Um After this point, he was trying to defend uh, Salazar, and they were just kind of, there was a lot of downtime. And in this downtime, uh, Pancho Villa actually wanted to meet with Alfego uh, to... He wanted him to hold on to some stuff for safekeeping, and so Alfego agreed, and when he went to go meet him, he was actually stopped by the United States Army because they'd blockaded all the roads into Mexico. Um, that kind of pissed Pancho Villa off, but not as much as the coup that Alfego claimed to incite against him. Uh, he kind of organized a coup against Pancho Villa, allegedly, and made out with one of his... Well, I mean, he actually did make out with one of these rifles. Uh, Pancho Villa had four custom-made rifles worth $1,000 each, and here's a picture of Alfego holding one of them years later, after things had calmed down, and I think Pancho Villa was dead at this point. Uh, but after pissing him off this much, he got a $30,000 bounty on his head, which somehow no one was ever able to claim. I guess it's because he's one tough hombre. Um, so... The man he was supposed to defend actually escaped from jail and fled back to Mexico, and Alfego was accused of conspiring to help him. But luckily, and totally not suspiciously at all, uh, Alfego had actually walked up to two marshals at the exact time that he was uh, uh, sprung from prison and um, asked them what time it was, because he was like, hey, what time do you guys have? And the guys were like, 9.30, and he was like, are you guys sure? I'm a couple minutes off here. And so he had an airtight alibi a mile and a half west of the prison uh, at the exact time of the uh, prison break. So weirdly specific alibi for him to go after, but I mean, it's, it's an alibi. So what are you going to do? Now, as this entire business with Salazar was winding down, uh, one of the other alleged conspirators, uh, Celestino Otero, and an accomplice, which is one of Salazar's lieutenants, um had actually tried to assassinate Alfego. He met with him in a town. The guy walked up to him with his hand in his overcoat, kind of really suspicious-like. Uh, but Alfego was being really cordial. He got the man to shake his hand, you know, kind of got him to calm down a little bit, and they kind of negotiated a different place to talk. And later on that day, when Alfego drove down to go talk to him, the guy actually tried to kill him. He pulled a gun and he shot at him, and it actually passed through the left side of his coat, but it didn't hit him. Now realizing what had happened, Malfago reached for his trusty colt and put two shots in the guy's side and killed him. Um, now when they were investigating afterwards, Alfago drove off after this point because he's like, I'm not waiting around to get shot out by more motherfuckers. Um, but he drove off and then he turned himself in later once he realized he was safe. And when they were investigating, they found out that the other guy's pistol had actually jammed. So Alfago and his old cowboy ways... Uh, made out pretty good since he was using that trusty old six shooter. No way to jam that. So the other guy just got away. He was just some guy. So he kind of just fled. Um, now late in Elfego's life, 
uh, at this point, I didn't add all the points here, but uh, at this point he'd actually gotten divorced, and he has like seven kids at this point, but you know, this is about Alfago. His family, you know, he didn't go to hell. This is about Alfago. This man's a legend. We need, we need to talk about him. Now, he was never, he never held another elected position, even though he, he tried goddamn hard to. Uh, he ran for governor, and he ran for state representative, and he just barely lost on both accounts. But he was really popular in politics to be sort of a spoiler, so people would actually give him money to run for their party. Um, now, during this time, he drank all a lot, and he went bankrupt for a while. But, you know, he was a private detective slash lawyer, so he didn't ever have too much t trouble finding work. Um, now, towards his twilight years, he was, he was starting to realize how amazing his life had been, and so he was looking for people to make a movie about him. Um, unfortunately, while he was alive, nobody really took him up on the offer. But, I mean, as we saw earlier, uh, Disney ended up taking up the mantle of telling his story. Um, and surprisingly enough, El Fago died a peaceful death in his home. He was waiting to listen to a radio broadcast on August 27th, 1945, and uh, he was hanging out, and he just died at the ripe old age of 80. So, you know, he lived a really full life and somehow got to die peacefully, especially with how much lead he dodged in his day. It's pretty impressive. And, uh, since I'm hitting all the bases in the rubric here, um, I really do think people should get to learn about Alfago Baca. It's hard to find good information on him, but I think that, you know, if a teacher kind of got some really good sources together and got to tell this man's story, I think it'd be a shame not to, because he, he did a lot of amazing things from very humble beginnings. He came from right here in Socorro, New Mexico, which is the last place you'd, sp you'd expect any, like, living legend to come from, and, uh, yeah. I think that uh, El Fago is somebody worth learning about. Um, but that's about all I have. I hope I didn't go too far over time, but if I did, I guess you'll just have to deal with it. Uh, yeehaw, and rest in peace to El Fago. Goodbye.